Hello, everybody, and welcome to Friday's live stream. We've got a lot of things to talk about, so let's just jump right in. So first thing, thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. But uh, today, it's been a pretty great day so far as far as the market goes. I mean, we've had uh, quite a, uh, a run-up, and it looks like everything is, uh, well, not everything, but most of the things are on the green. These are the days that I actually live for. They're great. We've had quite a long bear market, so uh, just enjoy the bullishness. And now I personally think we're uh, in a in a bullish market, but uh, things are doing pretty well. And of course, uh, everything kind of starts off with Bitcoin and we can see that, honestly, I mean, well, BNB is down because, you know, CZ had to step down and Department of Justice kind of got him for the anti-money laundering things. XRP is down a little bit. Solana is up 1, 1, 1, 1, 2.9. But the big news, I think, is this, this, 1.5 trillion. Our market cap finally, finally, hit where it's supposed to be, $1.5 trillion. And I think this is like one of these uh, psychological barriers. And I'm happy to see it finally to actually come to fruition because we were sitting around 1.43, 1.44 forever. And it seems like we broke through. Now, taking a look at this, we can see that Bitcoin today knocked into the 38 range, not just 38. It was uh, 38,307, pretty well. Like a little, little double top here and then it, it crashed down because people are going to take profits. Now, you have to understand, if you don't take profits, someone's going to do it for you. And that's okay. Some people are not here to trade little bits from 38.3 to 37.6 and whatnot. But I'm just telling you, if you are here for that, just know that's what's going to happen. Me personally, I'm waiting for uh, quite a longer time. I'm more of a dollar cost averager kind of cycle trader, but that's what we have. And then, of course, people take profits and it comes back and down. And things are looking pretty good and people are happy. So the question is why? Why is all this happening? Well, you have to understand most of it's sentiment. There's a lot of great sentiment out there. A lot of people are very happy. But another thing you have to take a look at, <clears throat> miners. Miners, if you don't know, or as far as like Bitcoin miners, those are the ones that are kind of like pushing the show. Uh, they're, they're the ones that are working the magic and pulling the strings behind the scenes for what is getting dumped onto the market. Because let's be honest, the Bitcoin miners are the ones that actually pull a lot of that sweet Bitcoin uh, for all the mining processes that they do. And they have to keep the lights on. And what does that mean? They have to sell Bitcoin. But what's interesting to me, they're not selling that much. So this is from uh, Coindesk. Bitcoin's hash rate war between Ant Pool and Foundry intensifies as Bitcoin ETF nears. And I think what's happening is that they're not selling as much because they're retaining it for the narrative, which is the ETF, maybe some more monetary policy easing, maybe a little quantitative easing, maybe a soft landing. But I found this interesting that and it talks about how Ant Pool and Foundry dominate Bitcoin mining. Analysts expect intensified competition between China and the U.S. as next as next year's reward having approaches. We're looking around uh, April or so. Copy in the comments section. Twenty twenty four. Having could spur demand for advanced mining rigs and affect market prices, with miners likely holding on to Bitcoin to spatial ETFs. And again, the two big dogs out there are Antpool and Foundry. Foundry is in the United States, and it holds 26.56, depending on the day that you're looking at it. And Antpool is 27.85. Antpool, coincidentally, is located in Beijing, China. Beijing, China, as I understand it, Bitcoin mining was banned. So I don't know what uh, exactly is happening, but that's what it is. But as far as like miners, they tell me, they go, Rob, you don't understand. As, if I have a mining rig and I want to connect to an actual uh, mining pool, I don't have to be in China. I could be in Ireland. I could be in Kansas. I could be anywhere I want to be. And it's up to me to decide where I'm actually going to input as far as like my mining rigs uh, for this mining pool. So and pool, I mean, I don't know if they're actually mining, but there is that is the pool that uh, uh, people are connecting to to mine Bitcoin for whatever rates that they get. Great. And then, of course, here's Foundry with 26% of the market share. But again, it's very interesting that there's just such a large amount uh, in just these two categories. Kind of concerning, uh, me personally. Let me know what you think about it in the comments section. But uh, I just found it interesting that Antpool is located in Beijing, China, but whatever. So while many argue that the halving is bullish for Bitcoin's price, some also say a significant bull run is more likely to depend on central banks and their M2 money supply. We'll take a look at that in a sec. And... Uh, there was a quote here. It says, we expect miners would only sell just enough Bitcoins to keep the business operating before any Bitcoin ETFs are approved just to keep the, the coins and borrow to pay. Because if you think about it, why would you sell right now? And again, I'm not saying for you. I'm just saying for the miners in general. You sell right now and Bitcoin is like we just took a look at 38,000. But maybe after this ETF gets approved, if it does get approved, now we start to see the in the 50s and the 60s. 
So why would you sell it right now, especially just to keep the lights on? I think what's happening is that you're seeing less and less selling because there's an anticipation of what could potentially be a breakout. The halving event will double the production costs though. So it's in the miner's best interest to get the latest models of the machine to lower the cost, earn more market share. So they still have to sell a little bit. I don't think it's they're selling like massive amounts like what you may see as time goes on. And there's a great chart to take a look at to understand the pricing action of the Bitcoin miners. This is from looking at Bitcoin.com. It's a free website, link in the description. And what the, blah, 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 blah. sorry, this is supposed to be pull multiple. We'll talk about the, the Bitcoin hash rate. First of all, I put this up there for a reason. When they talk about how there's a, there's a war right now between uh, Antpool and Foundry, you better believe it. Look at this hash rate. We just hit an all-time high yesterday, two days ago. Just yes, just two days ago, we hit an all-time high for the hash rate. That's the computational power that's being used to mine Bitcoin. And there is a race going on. There's a lot of big money who are into the Bitcoin mining operation, and they think that it's going to do something big. And maybe they're putting all their money into it because of what's going to happen next year. Now we get into the Puel multiple like we were supposed to. The Puel multiple is pretty great because you can take a look at it's a It's the supply side. And it takes a look at Bitcoin miners and their revenue. It's calculated by dividing the daily issuance value of Bitcoins by the 365-day moving average. So what these miners get as far as the value divided by the moving average of daily issuance. And what's great about this, it's just it's one of those indicators that I used in my 80% uh, sell-off video. And uh, links in the description uh, for that video of when I'm going to sell 80% of all my crypto. And it's one of the indicators I use and you can use for free to see when things get a little bit overheated. And you can see right here that in 2013, it pretty much nailed it. Actually, let's go back. 2011 even nailed it. I'd be damned. 2011, 2013 was a double top. 2017, pretty much topped out in the red, did pretty good. Now you'll see over here, it didn't do a great job as it did before. So it actually thought, we started to get in the red area in March 14, 2021. And the price of Bitcoin at that point was 59,000. Now. You could have went here and go, okay, I'm going to sell some. It's a pretty good indicator when it gets in the, like, that's why I like looking at Bitcoin because I'm not a genius. I need colors. I need people to dumb it down for me. So when you're in the red, it's overheated. I should sell some. And when it's in the green, you're like, hey, it's kind of cooling off. Maybe I should buy some. And then I just kind of go from there. So for this one, you might have looked at this and go, yeah, it's a pretty good idea. Now, as high as we're at, again, the hash rate is an all-time high, but we're, we're dividing that by the daily issuance and the 365 day moving average. So we take a look here. I mean, we're right in the middle. We've got a long way to go before things top out, but it's something to definitely take a look at. It's something I think everybody should take a look at if they're deciding on when they might be actually selling. So there comes that. And then there was that one piece where they talked about the M2 money supply, because a lot of people, uh, actually me, myself, and I, actually, uh, and Ben and Guy, we kind of agree that uh, you know when there's more liquidity in the market, there's more people that are more willing to buy crypto digital assets. Imagine in 2020 when we had a run up of trillions of dollars being dumped in the market by the good old U.S. Treasury because of this thing called a Corona sickness or the Cervasa virus, and then we had a bunch of money come in, and it was a big run up. But I want to show you something. This is the M2 money supply. <clears throat> we can see that since its inception. As far as Bitcoin goes, <clears throat> when it started actually tracking, actually Bitcoin was in 2009. 2008 was the white paper, 2009 was the Genesis block. We can see in 2010, <clears throat> there's quite a correlation between the M2 money supply as it goes up and the price of Bitcoin. If we look at it just in like a, in like a line, we're like, yeah, makes sense, right? But I want you to take a look at this, a real hard look at this. So as this goes up, <clears throat> things get overheated, right? I think things are overheated especially in 2011, it got pretty high. A whopping 35 bucks, watch out. But you see how much it dropped off? It dropped off precipitously. And now it went down to $3. That's quite a dump. That's like 90%. But the money supply went up. Why did that happen? It just happened because things got overheated. And then of course we come over here, it ran up and it dropped off a little bit. The double top, as I talked about, <clears throat> And it went from $1,000 and it bottomed out around 200 bucks. But yet the money supply kept going up. So yes, it is true that when we have more liquidity in the markets, we see things. 
but then that's not the end all be all. And it's the same thing with the having. It's not the end all be all. Like everything is like perfectly timed around the having. I personally believe in the four year cycles, but I'm flexible enough to say, hey, you know what? When things change, I'm going to change. And that's what it comes down to. So, of course, we look at this. And of course, in 2017, what happened? It went, it just, it got overheated. And I'm just going to tell you guys a, a, a secret that's a pretty on, on, it's a pretty well-known secret, which is this. People are going to tell you in the next bull run that things will never come down and it's awesome. And because of this great technology that people are going to buy forever because now people just get it in mass adoption. They're full of it. Because I heard that same narrative in 2017. And I know you heard that same narrative in 2021. And now here we are again and we're down. So it's not a super cycle. Nothing goes up forever. And just remember that at some point you may want to take profits. Now, if you want to, you know, diamond hands it and uh, wait for 10, 20 years, you'll probably be way ahead, quite honestly, because Bitcoin's only gone up. But again, maybe there's some things you want to do. Maybe you want to pay off some bills. Maybe you want to do something to, I don't know, maybe you don't like living in a cardboard box, whatever. So in this situation, maybe you take some profits. But again, I just want to show you the M2 money supply that yes, it does go up. Yes, it's greater as liquidity. But even as the money supply went up, Bitcoin still went down in some instances. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And then also Ethereum, because we're going to talk about Bitcoin. I mean, we should talk about Ethereum. It's the one-two punch, it seems like. And uh, this is an article that talks about how Ethereum price reclaims 2K as data shows a surge in network activity. First of all, is that even true? All right, it's true. 2088. It's up 1.2%, but almost 8% for seven days. And actually, you know what I'd like to see? Where is it? Uh, ah, there it is. Let's put this all in Bitcoin. You know, you can take a look at what's bleeding against Bitcoin just by putting everything in Bitcoin. So like Ethereum, we know it's up. I mean, it's up for the seven day against Bitcoin, three and a half percent. But most, not most, but some are down a lot. Like they're up against their dollar pairs. But look at this red. It's just something to consider, except for Caspa. Congratulations, Caspa holders. And it's just sprinkled around. And BitTensor, wow, look at that. So anyhow, Ethereum, and I'm not going to go over the article because it's kind of boring. Let's just take a look at the network activity, huh? So first of all, I would like to take a look at ultrasound money. This is what it takes a look at as far as uh, if as Ethereum starts to get used, then of course more things get burned. And then uh, now that we went from proof of work to proof of stake, it is now, they say, deflationary. And I'm taking a look at it over a day. It's down 0.189%. Not bad. Let's take a look at seven days. Make it 0 0.32, 30 days, 435 days. And actually, the supply chain, that's a lot, 277,000. And then, of course, overall time, we can see that since the merge, it's, it's gone somewhat deflationary. But there's a great little tool right here where it says simulate proof of work. Check this out. Let's go back. So this white line here is if everything would have stayed in the proof of work section, if we just said, okay, well, let's not go over to proof of stake. What would we have done? How inflationary would it would have been? Well, in an hour, would have, when I went up 3%. In one day, 3.19. Seven days, 3.06. 30 days. And you can see the difference here. It's not like a ton, but it's quite a bit to say to yourself, all right, well, it's a little bit deflationary, although it's the merge. Not as much as it should be as far as burning goes. But again, I think it's an interesting piece that uh, as more people use Ethereum, more it gets burned. Now the question becomes, that's just burning part. What about TVL, or total volume locked up? Well, we take a look at DeFi Llama. We can see that not really if we just take a look at this huge graph. This is the TVL for the total value locked for all chains, Ethereum, Tron, BSC, Arbitrum, and so on and so forth. But if we zoom in, let's see, let's do Ethereum. There we are. If we zoom in, because of course, TVL was way, way more back in 2021. We had all time highs, right? But that's not what we're looking at. We have to be cognizant of right around these days. So let's take from the last so July or so. Let's kind of zoom in even more. Let's take October. So September 3rd, let's just take September, right? September 2023, you had 27 billion of TVL. 
Then we had a little bit of a dump, 25 billion. But today, yeah, 35. So there's, I guess, you know, 8 billion more. So I guess there is a little bit more activity. That's the thing that we want to see. And the question I have is, that's great that TBL is there and we have more transactions, but you know, how much is that and how much can that be manipulated? What if we take a look at the NFTs? Who's buying NFTs? And then we'll get to the fees. Now, this is interesting. If you go to CryptoSlam.io and take a look at the amount that's being traded for NFT sales volume, look at that sales volume. 13 million, this is just in one day. You can break it down by 24 or 7, 30 days in all time. For the sales for just one day, you got 13 million. It's the highest out of all the chains. But if you just look to the second slide here, or second, second column, you see wash. And you see total. You're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why is the sales 13, the wash 23, and the total 36? Oh, it's 63% are wash sales. What are wash sales? Great question. What's NFT wash trading? Wash trading is when the buyer and seller in a transaction are the same person or two people colluding. <laughs> so let me say that again. Wash trading is when the buyer and seller in a transaction are the same person or two people are just going back and forth. It's banned in conventional financial markets because it misleads the rest of the market about the true level of demand, is dips, distort prices, and entices others to trade or fake information. I gotta tell you, that's pretty much true. I think it's just uh, telling this is just the NFT side. I'm not going to talk about the transaction or anything else. But you can see that the wash percentage is the highest. And the second highest is Polygon, which is the layer two for Ethereum, which makes total sense, right? And the third highest, I believe, is Avalanche. So, hey, what are you going to do? So 63% of that is wash trading. And But look at this. I found this interesting, too. The sales, the total sales of uh, NFTs on Bitcoin called ordinals. The wash rate is only 0.05%. And they got a volume of, like I said, 9.4, almost 10 million. That's pretty good for, of course, it's eating up the transactions and everything else, but I like it. That looks pretty, uh, uh, for what we wanna see, low wash trading and high volume, fantastic. And then the last question is this. What about the fees? What about the fees? The fees themselves are what I think are the most important. I mean, we can see the TVL and the things that are actually flowing into there and the amounts, but uh, this is paying for, actually paying for things and actually using it. The first thing I will tell you is that Ethereum and Bitcoin are always on top and they're fighting for that supremacy as far as like fees, especially with Bitcoin and ordinals. But today we have this thing called KyberSwap. And the one-day fees are 108,486,743. So we'll get to that in a second. Ethereum still has pretty high fees. Bitcoin still has high fees. And uh, you may have noticed that when you've been swapping or moving Bitcoin, that the fees are kind of outrageous. That's just how it is. But this thing right here, KyberSwap, it, can, it confused me because I'm like, why is KyberSwap number one in fees? This doesn't make any sense. This is why it makes sense. Dear Kyber, KyberSwap Elastic users, we regret to inform you that KyberSwap Elastic has experienced a security incident. First of all, what's KyberSwap? Uh, it's the cross-chain DEX and aggregator on 15 chains, enabling users to trade smart and maximize earnings. Well, that's not great. Another hack for another DEX, and it seems like this is a almost an everyday occurrence, every week occurrence, we'll say. So if you're in Kyber Network and have anything on there, be careful because uh, you probably lost a little bit. As a precautionary measure, we strongly advise all users to promptly withdraw their funds. Our team is diligently investing in the situation. We commit to keeping you informed with regular updates. Thanks for understanding. Yes, thanks for understanding. You trusted us and uh, we let you down. So bummer, bummer. Here's what's going on. This was actually yesterday. Uh, Kyber Swap hacker opens doors for negotiations after the $45 million exploit. So as far as the fees go, I'm not exactly for sure why this is uh, putting it this way or or what was actually happening, but uh, it looks like, well, maybe this will make sense in a second. The KyberSwap hacker has shown a willingness to, get, to negotiate for exploiting the decentralized exchange for around 45 million. The attacker publicly messaged, messaged KyberSwap. I gotta tell you, this is a ballsy move. 
you just uh, ripped off people for tens of millions of dollars and you sent them a message. Dear KyberSwap developers, employees, DAO members, and LPs, negotiations will start in a few hours when I'm fully rested. Thank you for understanding after I ripped everybody off. Now, maybe he's a white hacker and just wants to do a good thing. Just like, hey, just give me an NFT or something. But hey, whatever. I mean, uh, people have bug bounties and uh, they pay hackers all the time. So that's just uh, par for the course. And it looks like people might get their money back. But uh, here's how it's done. Blockchain security firm Cybers Alerts estimated the theft to be around 45 million across different chains, 20 million on Arbitrum, 15 on Optimism, 7 million on Ethereum, 2 million on Polygon, and 300 KM base. Not too bad. Attacker was funded by the virtual cryptocurrency mixer Tornado Cash. Great. More ammunition for politicians. And then Adam Cochran, a partner at uh, Cinema. Cinea? Ah, I'm not going to try it. Ventures suggests that the attack was to flash loans and some sort of math rounding issue. Each transaction is starting with an Ethereum balance coming in, looped, mint, redeem, swap. You know what that means? Lots of fees. You know what that happens? They just ran up that kind of fees. Insane. So that's what we have for KyberSwap. I hope you weren't uh, affected in that. And, uh, you know, that's just par for the course. I think we're going to see more of that as time goes on, especially with DEX is becoming more prevalent. Because I personally believe that the next narrative is going to be, for the next bull run, gaming, AI, and DEXs. I'm going to tell you why. We did a video yesterday with uh, me and Sheehan. Sheehan Chandrasekara. He is uh, uh, one of the top CPAs over there at Cointracker. And uh, we did a video about what the IRS rules are for what a broker-dealer is. And uh, this was just yesterday. Pretty good video. Almost had 56,000 views. A lot of people were... I thought it was interesting that a lot of people watch this because it's all based on uh, taxes and whatnot. But the big the big takeaway was this. What the IRS wants to do is they want to do uh, KYC and AML on all wallets. Any wallet that's out there, especially in that you can swap, especially with DEXs, they want to get KYC. They want to have know your customer, anti-money laundering on everything out there. So all these wallets that you're like, you're using, you're moving things around, guess what? They want to know what that is. And I think with these types of things that are happening, that's just more ammunition for what's going on. And I said in the video, I, th I said, I think there's going to be fallout from this because, and this is just in America, you have to understand, Americans, you know, USA, what are you going to do? Because of this, it's a brain drain from, from America. A lot of the different projects don't want to deal with us. A lot of DEXs don't want to deal with us because we're just too much of a hassle. And this is the problem. This was a choke point. This is one of those things I think that they want to put in place. They said they want to protect us. I think in all honesty, they just want to protect the dollar. And they want to protect uh, the massive amount of inflows uh, that is traditional finance. And I said there'd be uh, repercussions, and I think this is one of them. So Lightning Wallet, uh, they quit the U.S. Why? Probably because what we just talked about over here. This just came out today. So Wallet of Satoshi has, remo has removed itself from the U.S. Apple and Google app confirming it will not serve customers in the country going forward. They didn't, spy, didn't specify the reason, but come on, America's sucking right now for their decision, but sought to assure existing customers in the U.S. that their funds were safe and available to transfer another wallet. But again, we don't want to serve you because we're sick of you Gary's protecting you guys so hard. So let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And that led me to the last piece that we'll talk about and we'll get into the Q&A, DEXs. So, first of all, I'm in Puerto Rico, and thankfully I can use this great DEX called Orca. It's Orca, O-R-C-A dot S-O, and it runs on Solana. You can do a bunch of cool stuff. I mean, you can buy some, I mean, everything that's on Solana, if you're into that. But look at this now with these network fees. It's so, it's so fast. Like, if you use Uniswap, that's, it's kind of cumbersome. But this one's very smooth, and I was just comparing the fees. So the fee is 0. 0.0002, which is fractions of a penny. And I took a look at Uniswap. And of course, yes, this was layer one. But look at these gas fees for ETH. 22 bucks. Get out of here. That's crazy. And then this one was MinSwap. This is on Cardano. And of course, the, the liquidity provider fee is not bad. It's uh, 0. 0.12 ADA, which is nothing, really, because ADA is like around 39 cents right now. But the batcher fee is 2 ADA. And that's roughly... 78 cents because 39.39 right 
And then of course you put 12 cents on you're looking at 90 cents somewhere. I mean, not at 0 0.128, excuse me. So, I mean, that's not too bad. I mean, for what it is. So that's probably like one of the better ones. And then also if, even if you take a look at some, cause some people said, but Rob, you know, layer twos, if you're going to use Uniswap, use layer twos and move things around. And it's true. It's only like nine cents or 10 cents. But again, I mean, if you want to do that, as far as like price goes, I mean, the Orca still beats, beats these, you know, 10 cents and who knows if it gets congested. I mean, not just more than a week ago, Matic had some of their highest prices, which was like, I think it was like over 20 cents, which we, we think, oh, that's not too bad considering gas fees. But as time goes on and things get more congested, I think the prices will go up unless they can fix that with, you know, roll ups and such. But if we take a look at this and people say, well, yeah, but L2s are so much, so much more cheap or cheaper. However, yes, but you understand to swap and to bridge things over if you have to, like it's you have that same problem. If you're going to go from from layer two and you, and, you, and you pick up things on on Polygon, whatever that is, you want to bring over to, to to the Ethereum side, you're still going to pay. Not all the time if you're just doing in. I mean, on the Polygon network, but at some point when you want to sell things, you want to move it over. I'm just saying it is one of those deals. So uh, that's what we have for that. Again, the narratives. Um, AI, uh, gaming, and uh, DEXs. If you'd like to delve into that more a little bit about what to potentially invest in and do your own research, because I can't tell you what to do, uh, go to CoinGecko, click on categories. I mean, you can be here. This is the main thing. Categories, categories, there we go. And uh, you have coins that are centralized exchanges and you get to centralized exchange coins. And you click on that. And of course, I have everything in Bitcoin. Let me change that back real quick. Oh, no, I have it. USD. And you can see some of the top uh, top ones out there. Uniswap, eh, ThorChain, Synthetics, DYDX, Pancake, Curve Dow, Gnosis, Osmosis, One Inch. One Inch, pretty good. Loop Ring, Sushi Balancer, and so on and so forth. There's Orca, 247. Damn, that was up 20% in a week. Pretty good. Anyhow, so let me know what you think about that in the comments. And then, of course, all these things that we're talking about, it all comes down, if you're going to use a DEX, the reason why you're using a DEX because you don't really like centralized exchanges or SEX, S-C-E-X, not S-E-X. And of course, you want to take that off because you follow some of the rules that I put out, which is the third rule number three is 0% on exchanges. Why do we do that? It's because I think most of us learn a lesson, either through Mt. Gox or Voyager or Celsius or BlockFi, take your pick, FTX, all that good stuff. So you want to do that and maybe you want to use a DEX because you have everything in crypto, and you, know, you don't need an on-off ramp all the time, so use a DEX. I will just tell you like this, if you're looking for a cold storage wallet, I just had to use a ledger today. I don't know why the heck I ever thought that was a good product. <laughs> it is the most cumbersome thing to, to use, and it's just very clunky. I think this one is, of course, the future. I don't even have a ledger uh, link anymore. I have no affiliation with Tangem. They don't support the channel, but I do have affiliate links. And now they're having a uh, probably a Black Friday sale. So if you use the link in the description, you get 10% off, three cards and two cards. Also, as a reminder, they're not only doing where you put the private keys in the in it's actually embedded into the cards, but you can actually do a mnemonic phrase or a seed phrase that you can write down somewhere. <clears throat> and if you need to write down your seed phrases, don't be like me and put your Cardano seed phrase from the test, the, from the test net onto a scrap of paper and then lose 20,000 Cardano, which would have been worth $60,000 at the very peak if I would have had them, but I lost them because I lost my mnemonic phrases. Use a shield folio. And today, I'm sure you guys are getting bombarded with Black Friday offers, so I apologize, but this is a really good deal. Today, see, instead of paying 45 bucks for one, it's $35 for one. And if you put in the code Dan, you get $7 off that and it's 28 bucks. And it's a buy one, get one free. So you get two books for 28 bucks. And all you got to do, links in the description, there's Tangem, there's my deep dive video, you can understand it. And then here's uh, <clears throat> the stone book or shield folio right there. And that's it for today. So look, a lot of things to go over. Uh, went a little bit long, sorry about that. But uh, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing, everything to talk about is time sensitive from there. So thanks, I appreciate it.